All right, so let's uh, let's kick off. So welcome to this presentation on G-Square CPU. Um, in this presentation, I want to mainly focus on how we can use GPU computing effectively within larger frameworks uh, instead of looking at more of the uh, granular uh, parts of our codes or our algorithms. So first of all, um, what we're going to discuss today. So we're going to do a quick recap on what is G-Square CPU? How can we use it? Um, after that, we're going to have uh, a look at how to use it within frameworks. So how can we use uh, DQMH modules effectively? How can we use active framework mo uh, actors effectively, uh, even with multiple devices? Then we're going to go a little bit more into uh, the organizational part of what different types of devices we, uh, will you find in the, in the wild and how can you account for them or how can you design around them? And then lastly, we're also quickly going to discuss uh, continuous integration. So how can we verify that our algorithms with GPU computing are doing what they're supposed to do, even if your continuous integration machine doesn't have a GPU? But before that, let's kick off. Who am I? Um, I'm Nathan. Um, I'm a CLA, a LabVIEW champion. I um, started using LabVIEW about 10 years ago um, and liked it, liked to search for the limits of LabVIEW and then just go way over it. So I, I did some other pre presentations before that on FPGA accelerated computing. Um, I did a couple of presentations on how I figured out how to run LabVIEW on Android and iOS. If you're interested in that presentation, I'm giving that presentation again this summer in Brussels on the CN Rode event. So if you're interested, feel free to come over. Uh, and of course, GPU computing made easy with G-Square CPU. Currently, I'm working for QPlox Engineering as a LabVIEW R&D architect. Um, I'm deployed at iMac in Leuven near Brussels. Um, and before that, I was also deployed at ASML. Um, and some of you might still know me uh, because five years ago, I used to work for National Instruments as an application engineer. Okay, let's, let's jump right in. So the introduction to G-Square CPU. So G-Square CPU is actually more high performance compute toolkit than a purely GPU uh, library. So the benefit of G-Square CPU is it's a compute library with which we can uh, offload our calculations during runtime across multiple different targets. It can either be a CUDA GPU or an OpenCL GPU, which means you can access multiple manufacturers, not only NVIDIA, or even you can just use the CPU. Um, there are also options for FPGAs, but those haven't been well tested just yet. But how we can use uh, G-Square CPU uh, is quite simple. So the first thing we do is say, hey, what technology do we want to use? Do we want to use CUDA, OpenCL, Intel One API, um, as you can see here in the block diagram. And then after that, we can select a specific device. So if you have multiple CUDA devices or multiple OpenCL devices with that setting of the device ID, you can select uh, the one you want. Uh, there are also options to discover the available devices, of course. Um, quick thing to keep in mind here, uh, it's best to do this order for setting the backend and then device ID because your devices will change depending on the backend you're using or the technology you're using. Um, once that's done, we can upload the data in LabVIEW to the GPU. So this is done either by the upload array function or uh, in, in, newer ver uh, in newer versions of G-Square CPU, we can just feed in the arrays directly uh, into the functions themselves. If you want to know how I did that, uh, have a look at the Malleable VI's presentation me and Tom did uh, a couple of hours ago. Um, once we send the data to the GPU, we can do operations, but we do need to keep memory management in mind. Um, so by default, uh, the functions will release the memory saying, hey, we no longer need this memory once the operation is done. So for example, here we have the input two, which is uploaded to the GPU. Um, and then here we're saying, hey, we're using this in the ads, but we need to say, hey, auto release, please put this to false to say, we're gonna use this later on, don't remove this from memory. Uh, and then we're, we can use it later on. And here I don't have any auto release uh, disabled, so it will automatically release 
this function. We can also feed in scalars if we want. Uh, it's not always applicable, but we can just feed them in and then uh, get the results. So that's the basics of a, of a simple script or a simple function, but there are hundreds of functions. Um, anything from data management to mathematics to linear algebra, statistics, there are a lot of factor algorithm functions. Uh, Boolean logic is fully implemented. Uh, a ton of signal processing functions from approximations to FFTs. Uh, there's a machine vision and image processing library uh, directly available and also there are a ton of debug tools, um, custom probes, um, performance analysis tools and so on. Um, next is uh, a little bit on the internal workings of G-Square CPU itself. So if we think back to, to the example where we were setting the environment, so setting the, the backend and the device, uh, PJ was asking why is input one not into the sub VI? Let me just quickly hop on over back. Uh, so this was just to showcase the two different options. Um, so input one can be fed, or the inputs can be fed directly into the function, or we can upload it to the GPU manually. Um, this is just quickly to showcase both uh, possibilities. The, the top one with input one is great um, if you just have a singular input. Um, if you're going to use the same value at multiple places, it's actually better to upload it uh, to the GPU first because you only have one copy of uh, memory or only copy of the data that you're using. So it saves quite a lot of uh, memory. Let's hop on over back. Okay, so queued operations. So we're setting the environment, we're setting uh, the device. And then the first thing we do is we upload our data. We're going to do some operations and then at the end, we're going to download uh, that data. But how does it work in the back? And it's really good to know how it works in the back because it allows you to effectively design your applications to maximize uh, performance. So actually, the, the back end or the, the engine itself behaves like a QMH. So for each device, for each back end, a new QMH is created. And when we say, hey, we're uploading data, we're just sending a message to the backend saying, hey, uh, with, with a payload, of course, here is some data. And then we're doing a ton of operations, one after the other, um, but these are non-blocking. As long as we are not requesting a response or a value within LabVIEW itself, uh, they will actually execute even before they're finished, um, or the, the VIs will execute before they're finished. So we send an operation one saying, hey, uh, use the reference of the uploaded data, do another, do another, do another uh, until we're done. But in the meantime, while it's doing those operations, we're already waiting at the download data. So only at the end, uh, we will download the data. Uh, the benefit of this approach is this makes better use of your GPU rather than doing an operation and then the operation needing to wait for LabVIEW to send another operation. You can just enqueue a pipeline and we'll just maximize the throughput. Um, this does mean that uh, your operations uh, are not a good indicator of the speed, but uh, the download data will be blocking uh, as long as the data is not available yet. Um, so as long as you're using uh, the references, references themselves, so the, the, after, you upload it, uh, after you upload the data, those wires, um, it will just run instantaneous. Um, it will be blocking when the operation needs to put out the results. So this is for download data, but there are also other functions, one of which we're going to see a little bit later on, uh, like getting the mean value or the global mean value, which will put out a scalar value uh, into LabVIEW. So to get that scalar value, it needs the results. So that's going to be blocking. BJ um, is asking any limits to the data that can be passed into and out of the GPU. Um, as far as I'm aware, the only limitation I've ever reached was the amount of uh, video memory I had on my GPU. So if I have six gigs of VRAM on my GPU, that's about as much data I can send. But we have different data types going all the way from eight bits to 64 bits uh, and everything in between. So if you, you, sorry, if you use uh, smaller data sizes, um, you will make better, uh, make better use of, uh, of that memory. Um, and also when using probes, so G Square CPU has probes, we can place probes on the wires and they will immediately download the data and they will also give some statistical information. 
Um, but because they need to represent that data into uh, LabVIEW, it will also block the operation until the, uh, the probe is fully executed. Next up, uh, environment interoperability. So LabVIEW doesn't exist in a vacuum, um, and that's one of the main or one of the main pillars of G squared CPU. Uh, it allows for easy uh, communication with other environments. So G squared CPU is built upon array fire, and this means that the pointers, the files generated. Uh, are compatible with the other environments which have these libraries. So ArrayFire itself comes uh, has a default or has uh, an out of the box C, C++ and Python library um, with which it can communicate, but there are also Rust, Ruby uh, and Swan libraries uh, with which it can also communicate. So if you have others in your team using C, C++ or whatever, um, you can easily communicate with them or send data over. Uh, you don't have to create an entirely new abstraction layer um, and if you're sharing context, uh, you can even share pointers. So you don't have to pull out the data off the GPU to send it to, uh, back to the GPU. You can hand over the pointer and uh, C, C++, Rust can just immediately work with it. Um, for environments like Python, who often don't share context with LabVIEW, uh, there is also standardized file IO uh, function of, uh, functions available. So ArrayFire comes out of the box with functions to save to file. Um, and any uh, ArrayFire library uh, can read those back in. So if you have C, C++, Python, uh, created, uh, creating files, you can load them in into uh, LabVIEW, uh, but also vice versa. So great support for all those environments. So if people are working with Python, they're using TensorFlow, and then they're do doing some extra operations uh, with ArrayFire, uh, you can just immediately use that data. Next up, uh, packages. So uh, there are two packages. The first one is the community package. Um, it's a VI package manager package. Um, it's left you 64 bits. Uh, unfortunately, there's not much I can do about that. Um, this is due to CUDA only being uh, available in 64 bits um, since I think 2017. NVIDIA does not support 32 bit anymore. Uh, the community license, uh, the community edition is free. Um, that being said, you need a license, just contact toolsnetwork at ni.com and they will happily hand over a free license. Um, there are only a couple of caveats on the community edition. First of all, all codes that you create needs to be publicly, sh publicly shared. That's what makes it a community edition. Um, also, you have near full functionality. Um, builds are disabled. Um, custom tools like um, the uh, benchmarking utility is disabled, uh, but for the rest, you have almost everything. Um, then we have the commercial package, um, same deal, VI, uh, VI package manager package, uh, left you 64 bit. This time it's a paid license. Um, there's a development license and a runtime license. That being said, um, it is a perpetual license, so there's no subscription. It's just you buy it once and then it's forever yours. Um, another benefit is IP doesn't have to be shared. Um, you can create builds, you have access to all custom tools, and something that has not yet been added to these slides, but, but is coming, is real-time support will also be part of the commercial uh, package. Um, for those interested in real-time support, I prepared uh, an example uh, at the end of this presentation, so stick around if you want to see that. Now, with the new version 1.3 that released uh, a week ago or two weeks ago, uh, multi-device support was added, which means we can use multiple GPUs at the same time, or even CPU and GPUs at the same time. And those GPUs don't even have to be purely CUDA. You can have OpenCLs and uh, OpenCL GPUs and CUDA GPUs uh, mixed as as you want, as you need. Um, to use multi multi devices, there are a couple of things we need to keep in mind. Um, but in the end, it, it does uh, become quite intuitive. So here we have a simple piece of code. We're setting the environment once again, the backend, the device. Uh, we're doing an operation and we're pulling the data back out. In this case, I'm not doing any upload array. I'm just feeding the arrays directly into the function. Well, the first thing that we need to do is we need to enable multi-device by going to properties in your 
uh, project and adding the conditional disable symbol uh, G2 CPU multi device. Uh, once that's done, it tells the entire environment, hey, from now on, we're no longer globally setting uh, the device uh, the device and the backend. Rather, it's going to be defined on a per thread basis. Um, video is going a little bit faster than I wanted it to. So next thing that we need to do is change the time loop for each device. Um, and what's going to happen is we're going to actually assign a device we're going to assign a backend to the specific loop. Um, so this is thread-based, and this is also the reason why we can't use while loops. Uh, in LabVIEW, while loops are multi-threaded, but the LabVIEW scheduler does have the tendency from time to time to switch around threads. Um, so we need to lock them in, and that's why a time loops. Otherwise, you're going to get uh, some weird behavior. Um, so we, next, up, that, uh, next up, what we do is uh, we set the technology and device in the time loop. Um, and the recommendation here is to make sure it's only set once uh, during, uh, during, during your execution. You can do it multiple times, but it's better not to do it every iteration. Um, I noticed the array fire engine can become unstable if you're asking it to change the backend and changing the device uh, a thousand, 10,000 times a second. So um, this, this works great. Um, so the main thing here is just make sure your uh, backend and device is within the loop and every uh, anything executed within that loop will be based on that specific backend and device. Now, this is for one device. How can we now use multiple devices? Well, we just copy the time loop. We can put as many as we want. We can put different operations in each loop uh, and each loop can have its own backend device. So this top one can be the CPU, this, uh, this middle one can be a CUDA card, and this other one can be an OpenCL card. And they will, uh, they will be completely out of each, other with, uh, each other's way as long as we use the time loops. So that's the basics. Um, maybe do also quickly point out, so the time loops are just purely me trying to get around uh, a quirk of the left view scheduler uh, switching uh, window threads around. But the benefit here is you can use sub-VIs as much as you want. Um, not a problem. Uh, you don't have to mess around with context wires going into each function, defining what, uh, what device you're using. Keeps your functions nice and clean, especially when we're looking at the larger uh, frameworks and architectures. Now, to quickly give a summary on the difference between multi-device and single device. So when we're doing, when we use single device, it means we either have no G2 CPU multi-device variable sets or it's set to anything else but true. Um, and then whenever we call the backends and device ID, the uh, it's set globally. So um, if we have multiple while loops uh, calling it, they might interfere with each other. So please keep that in mind when you have single device of, uh, enabled, um, but you don't need time loops. So that's always good to, uh, good to know. So you can just use LabVIEW as you know it. Um, and data can be freely shared. So if you have multiple parts in your program, you can send over uh, your references of, of data to multiple loops without thinking, are they using the same device? Are they using the same technology? Well, with multi-device, well, we have to set the, the project variable. Um, and then we set, uh, then the device and technology is set per thread. So every time loop will have its own uh, device and backend assigned. Um, and through that, um, through time loops, we lock the threads. And we need to take care in making sure that the data that we share between uh, loops is uh, being referenced by the same technology. So if you have two, uh, uh, two loops, both using CUDA, you can share data. But if one is using OpenCL and the other one is CUDA, they are not able to understand each other. Uh, when you're doing that, it's better to quickly pull the data back into LabVIEW to then send it over to OpenCL. Next up, usage within frameworks. Okay, now that we have multiple devices, what strategies do we have to, to make use of them? How can we effectively uh, use this? So there are two main trains of thoughts. Um, and of course, you can also go hybrids. Uh, the first one is task oriented. So we can have a time loop for each task that we're doing. So let's say uh, our operator needs an FFT to be visualized. So we have a UI FFT. 
while we're also checking for triggers in the data at high speeds and we're doing some statistics for some analysis all in line. Um, so we have a time loop for each task. And the benefit here is we can easily define where is each task going to run. Uh, often it's better to run the UI functions on the internal GPU, uh, but internal GPU of your CPU with OpenCL while using the beefy CUDA cards for the high performance aspects. This is important because there's no priority control at the moment. So if you have multiple loops running at the same time, Tommy is saying something. Can we debug intermediate uh, operations? Yes, we can. So we can place probes in between operations and it will automatically pull the data uh, onto your screen. Okay, so no priority control. Um, so if you, if you push, push everything to, to one GPU, you need to keep in mind that they're gonna compete with each other. Um, so if you have a UI FFT, often it's, we don't need to run at really high speeds. If it stutters for a few moments, it's not as bad as, it, as when we would lose data or need to drop samples just to keep up. Um, a way around that is via working device oriented. So this is a little bit more work, but it gives a bit more flexibility. And here we actually create time loops for each device. Um, so we man here we can manually control which task is sent to which GPU uh, through an extra module that we add, uh, which is a data manager. Um, this scales quite well um, to multiple GPUs because if you create that, uh, if you create a good data manager, uh, you can then define where, where the priorities are to say, hey, now run here or run there. And if suddenly my operator adds an extra GPU and next run, the data manager can reconfigure itself saying, hey, now this is available. I can redistribute my tasks. Uh, next up, let's have a look at some codes. So how can we use it within a uh, framework? So first one I'm going to quickly show is Active Framework. Uh, we're going to do a deeper dive into DQMage later on. Um, so first of all, uh, there are two ways of using uh, Active Framework with multiple devices and G Square CPU. Um, I had a chat with Alan Smith on this. Um, he is a firm believer in helper loops. So it's the default way that we use Active Framework. Um, the only downside here is there are no operations that we can put in the messages themselves. Um, because the while loop in your actor core is just a regular while loop, it's not a time loop. Uh, any, anything executed in there uh, is, is gonna, gonna compete with, uh, with, uh, with the, the regular threads. Um, that being said, I do pref uh, prefer the helper loop uh, when there are only a few operations so that we can create events for each event, uh, for each operation. So all we have to do is create some user events. We create a helper loop um, beside our actor core. Um, this is just a time loop that you saw. And then for uh, here, I have a message saying, um, set the backend, set the device. So this is going to configure my helper loop to use a specific device and specific technology. Uh, once that's done, um, we can also do operations. So we can create uh, operations for each uh, task that we want to do. In this case, I'm quickly calculating the average coming in of, of some data. Um, then another way of working, and that's the one that I do tend to prefer on bigger projects, is overriding the actor. Um, some of you might consider this sacrilege, um, but I do find it helpful to remove a layer of abstraction with the, uh, with the helper loops uh, to certain points, especially with acute operations of, uh, of the functions themselves. But we change the actor core while loop to a time loop, nothing more. So we can actually put our operations into the me messages themselves. Um, so whenever we create a new message, we can just place the operations in there and we don't have to say, oh, okay, I'm now also create a new uh, event. Personally, I find it to make with bigger projects, it makes uh, managing them a lot easier. Next up, DQMH. Um, so DQMH, uh, I personally think even works better with G Square CPU, uh, especially with tester uh, functions. So to enable uh, multi-device support in uh, DQMH uh, is quite easy. 
So this is uh, just the basic uh, VIs that you get when you create a new module with the basic templates. I just add a couple of functions in here uh, to set the backends uh, and set the device. So all we have to do is first say, hey, uh, set the conditional disable variable, extremely important. And then we change our message handling to a time loop. And then also making sure your delta t is set to zero so it runs at full speed, so the behavior is exactly the same as a while loop. Um, and then we have, uh, we have to make sure that we have one message setting uh, the device uh, and, and backend. Um, the benefit here is uh, we can change it, uh, we can set it in the beginning during initialization, um, but when it's a message, it can also change over time. This is quite powerful. By the way, this also works in Active Framework. But this is quite powerful if, for example, uh, you have a lot of tasks running in parallel and suddenly one task stops running because it's no longer needed. Maybe you were doing some kind of post-processing or whatever, uh, and you're, you suddenly have a lot more resources available. So if you have a good manager, um, it can redistribute those tasks to more effectively use all resources. Um, and so by, by then sending a message saying, hey, now this task needs to run on another GPU, uh, the module can just uh, dynamically change itself. So defining events, they were quite similar. Uh, so let's say we have an event to calculate the mean value. Um, well, all we have to do is say, hey, we're creating an event. We make sure that we have the left view class or the, the data type uh, of, of G-square CPU and then uh, in, in our events. So this is nicely generated. And then we just put our functions here. A quick thing to note, passing references outside of the time loop is allowed. So let's say you make a reference to a CUDA card and you have another, uh, you have a couple of other while loops which are doing nothing with G-square CPU. They're just managing the data and you have another loop which is using the CPU. That reference itself is allowed to exist within other time loops and other while loops. The only thing you need to, uh, keep, uh, need to be aware of is you can't do operations on them unless they're in a correctly configured uh, time loop. That's the only caveat you need, to be, you need to be aware of. Another thing to note is probes uh, don't care. They, you can put a probe anywhere and normally they will be able to detect, hey, this, uh, this data on G squared CPU, it's not linked to this time loop it, or some other loop. It is uh, based on this technology. So the probe is going to reconfigure itself for that technology. Then it's going to check which device it's on. And then it's just going to nicely pull all the data in. Uh, so that was probes. Another interesting thing is testers. So let's say we create a module. We want to verify the behavior. Instead of testing it in the larger whole of our application, we can just test our modules uh, on themselves with DQMH testers. So here I have a tester for whenever I set the computational device. So I, I just send a message saying, hey, set computational device with device ID, device backend. But what you can also do is say, hey, my tester, which is running in a loop, let's also make this a time loop and make sure this tester is also following uh, any changes in the computational device that you set. So if you change the device ID or, or the backend, it will, the tester will also automatically reconfigure. Um, great thing about this is then, if we then do simple operations uh, in our tester to verify the behavior, they will automatically be in the correct environment. We don't have to suddenly go into our module and do kind of uh, that kind of stuff. It can all be on the tester side. Um, so in this case, I'm just doing a quick test of my calculation of a mean value. So um, I can do that in a couple of different ways. I can use file IO, I can use array creation, or I can just use LabVIEW to, uh, send, uh, uh, to upload data. Uh, personally, with DQMH testers, I do prefer uh, the file IO because we can just save the files and they're always going to be the same, uh, as well as they don't need any resources to regenerate uh, data, creating waveforms and that kind of stuff. So it goes a lot quicker. So next up, we're going to have a look at device topologies. What are the things you're going to see in the wilds? Um, so first of all, industrial computers. So industrial computers, they come in all shapes and sizes, different flavors. So 
a couple of things to watch out for with industrial computers. Um, first of all, they have a ton of different types of GPUs available, uh, depending on their form factor. Um, that being said, most industrial computers do have integrated graphics cards. So here we see a die shot of an Intel CPU. So it has four cores and there is this big area of a graphics processor, which is in your device. You're just not using it, but it's there. So why not use it? So we can communicate with, with it if you have the correct drivers installed uh, through OpenCL. Um, and this works for both Intel and AMD CPUs. Uh, so you don't even need a dedicated graphics card. You can just access it uh, with cheaper CPU. So by just going to the OpenCL backend, they're not super powerful, but I do found that often they're about two times the performance of a single CPU core. So in this case, you have a free 50% uh, performance increase just sitting here, uh, for which you, by the way, already pay. You paid for the CPU, so why not use it? Um, Personally, I recommend to use them for the UI. Uh, even if you have uh, dedicated graphics cards, uh, just visualization, uh, data processing for the UI, uh, I tend to put it on, on, that C, uh, on that GPU just because if it stutters, if for some reason the GPU is becoming quite hot, whatever, and then it needs to drop performance, uh, it's only the GPU that's affected, but your data processing, data logging, triggering, and so on, all the important things that need to run in line they will still run at the speed of that GPU. Um, also thing to note, uh, not all CPUs have integrated graphics. Um, some Intel CPUs, uh, especially high-end ones, server ones don't have integrated graphics cards uh, or GPUs. Uh, and also uh, certain embedded uh, CPUs don't have uh, iGPUs. So think of Serios, there are some with uh, these graphics cards in them, but there are also quite a lot that don't have them. So if you want to use this, uh, please make sure that you are aware of if the CPU has a graphics card in it or not. And you can just search this looking at what a processor is and then just going to the Intel website and seeing, hey, does this have a graphics card? Yes or no, or a GPU? Yes or no. Next up, we have internal GPUs. So GPUs that we can place within the box. Um, I have that specific card laying right here. Um, so they can be quite big, they can be quite small. Um, these can be from different manufacturers. So there is the Intel Arc lineup, which is fully compatible. The AMD Radeon series, which is completely compatible and also some uh, others. Uh, and then we also have the NVIDIA cards, uh, which are also fully uh, supported. So the first two uh, are only supported via OpenCL, while the NVIDIA cards are supported with both uh, OpenCL and CUDA. Uh, with industrial, uh, so we're going to see, uh, with industrial PCs, we're going to see two different types of devices or computers in general. Uh, first of all, you have the true industrial PCs. They tend to be a little bit smaller, not that much room, passively cool, thin rail, so not super big. So they tend to have a low power budget. So if you want to place a GPU in there, um, if, if it has a PCI slot available, which often is also half size, uh, you will only be able to put in a low end GPU, which if you just need that little extra push in performance, absolutely not an issue. Another benefit uh, is you have passively cooled options with the lower end GPUs. Um, so if you have a clean room, if you have uh, some highly controlled environments where blowers are not really allowed, uh, you can just use passively cooled uh, GPUs. Next up uh, are general desktop and rack mounted PCs uh, in industrial setups. These tend to have a really high power budget. So we can put in really beefy high end graphics cards of 500 watts or even more, uh, or we can even decide to put in multiple GPUs if you truly need a lot more performance. Next up, let's say you don't have uh, the room to add uh, an extra GPU or just you can only put in a low end GPU. There are external GPU options out there. Um, so again, this allows you to add an extra, uh, an extra Intel, AMD or Nvidia graphics cards. Um, they tend to have a high power budget. Um, of course, have a look at spec sheet of the specific external GPU enclosure you're buying because those often are rated for certain uh, wattages. 
they do come in different form factors. So I visualized them. So there's a rack mount, there's a tabletop, um, absolutely not an issue. Um, the bottom ones, you can connect them via Thunderbolt. So as long as your industrial computer has a Thunderbolt interface, you're good to go. Um, VJ is asking, uh, where does the laptop GPU fall on the scale in the previous slide? Um, let me just quickly pop back. So a laptop GPU tends to fall in, in, in the middle. So personally, this computer I'm currently running on uh, uses an RDX 4080, so it's really high end. But you also have lower end GPUs. Um, I have a specific slide on uh, laptops uh, in just a moment. So then it's going to become a little bit more clear or I hope fully clear, actually. Um, so Thunderbolt. Um, also, uh, I had a chat with Radex Technologies a couple of days ago. They are planning to, uh, to sell uh, an external PXI GPU enclosure. So instead of being bound by the performance of uh, the PXI, which is limited to 60 watts, 80 watts, 120 watts, depending, the, depending on the enclosure, uh, you can just put an external uh, GPU uh, and get a lot more performance. Uh, the benefit of the Radex uh, Technologies solution is it's based on, on PCI or PCIe. So it's a lot faster uh, than Thunderbolt. Talking about Radex, um, Radex Technologies, they also provide a line of PXI GPUs. So these are completely limited to NVIDIA with CUDA technology. Um, these tend to be, the PXI GPUs tend to be low to mid-end GPUs. This is purely dictated by the PXI chassis themselves. You can't put a 500 watt GPU into uh, a PXI. It just doesn't like it. Um, another benefit here is no need for external space. If you don't have room on your DIN rail, but you do have a slot available uh, in your PXI, then it might be more cost effective to add one of these uh, GPUs. And of course, no need for Thunderbolt. So if you have a controller, a PXI controller, uh, which does not support Thunderbolt, you can still use this. Next up, customer hardware, laptops. So in general, we're gonna see a couple of different, oh, Thomas is asking, when comparing GPUs, is the CUDA cores the primary data point to go by if I'm developing a basic image manipulation algorithm, how I might expect the GPU I need. So CUDA cores is not everything. Um, clock count is not everything. What I tend to recommend, and it's actually why I purchased the, the laptop I'm currently using is I tend to buy a high-end GPU. Uh, so I'm not constrained by memory. I'm not constrained by the graphics card itself. Um, and then just seeing how are my algorithms working. So my initial algorithm is going to be super greedy in regards to memory usage. It's not going to be optimized. But then afterwards, I can optimize it, try to get the memory profile as small as possible, uh, see how fast it can go through it. What's the idle time of my GPU? And then based on that, I can walk backwards to see, OK, what GPU would fit uh, that way of working, or that, uh, that algorithm that I'm using. That being said, I do recommend um, going for a certain performance and then doubling it, uh, not because I have stock in NVIDIA or anyone else, but rather um, customers come with new questions and you don't want to have a critically spec uh, solution. To, and then when a customer comes in saying, hey, I also want these calculations, you have to go, sorry, uh, we need to buy new hardware to get that up and run. So that would actually cost a lot more money than just getting a slightly better GPU. Um, customer hardware. So, yeah, and what I realized uh, is a lot of customers within their uh, IT portfolio, they have uh, four main uh, type of devices uh, when not talking about uh, industrial computers. So first of all, we have lightweight laptops. Um, I jokingly call them Excel machines because they're hyper portable. They have really long battery life but you can't really do anything high performance on them. So their compute power is extremely low just to gain that uh, battery performance. The technology they often provide is either the CPU or an OpenCL internal GPU. 
into uh, which is baked into the CPU. And personally, I tend to only recommend them for data viewing. So you can still use compute acceleration to make the data viewing a lot faster, maybe some minor post-processing, inline processing, um, but definitely don't go too far in it. Next up, we have analysis laptops. They tend to be medium compute power where they say, oh, okay, you might have a CUDA card, but you have the basics. And they tend to have enough compute power, both on CPU and GPU, uh, that at least you can use it for post-processing. So the idea with post-processing is uh, you might have a really big data set and the operations might take two minutes, might take 10 minutes. It's not the end of the world if it takes 10 minutes, the, the user just has to wait, um, but there's no process which is gonna fail. Next up, we have developer laptops. They tend to have high compute power. Um, often they have uh, quite a beefy CUDA card in them, uh, OpenCL again, CPU. Um, and they tend to be really powerful in regards to inline processing. So it's almost a, a desktop replacement or it is a desktop replacement laptop. And it can truly just any data you acquire immediately process it either on GPU, CPU or iGPU uh, and do whatever needs to be done with it. And then lastly, we have lab computers. So in a lot of labs, it's still quite common to have desktops or rack mounts uh, there. And then it's also, then you have extremely high power, so you can add uh, multiple GPUs as much as you need. Often it is also possible to just scale up saying, hey, I need more power, let me just quickly upgrade to the power source. Um, and as long as you have room within the case, you can add more GPUs. And those are absolutely excellent for inline processing. Um, now this is a quick, uh, this is a summary. Um, it might be that there are some deviations where someone is using a lab computer which is severely underpowered, um, but those are more the exceptions rather than the rule I found. Now for the last chapter, continuous integration. So I jokingly yesterday said, who, who has time for continuous integration? But I said jokingly, it is quite important. So continuous integration um, with uh, G-square CPU is completely possible, um, especially because we have the flexibility on which hardware it uh, can run. You can just verify your algorithm without needing to worry, hey, I need to plug in a specific GPU into my CI server or whatever, or do some weird uh, virtual machine configuration. Uh, most of the times uh, it works straight out of the box uh, and it will just automatically decide which uh, technology to use. So, with unit tests, we have, first of all, have the LabVIEW unit test framework. Um, this is NI maintained. Um, but that being said, I noticed there's a little bug in there where if you put out classes, especially parent-child classes, it doesn't really like it. Um, so whenever you set up and tear down VIs to create classes, to then send them to uh, your core function, I noticed that sometimes you might get really weird behavior and I even had uh, unit test files completely corrupt uh, due to it. So the way around that, if you want to use LabVIEW classes in general and use G-squared CPU uh, with, with the NI unit tests is uh, via test harnesses. So we create a single VI, we place all our functions in there, both with the setup and the teardown VIs, and we just call that test harness in its, uh, on itself. So a nice example here is just, I'm testing my addition. So I am uploading uh, certain inputs, I'm downloading certain outputs, and these are just fed into uh, the unit test framework. Next up, we have Karaya by JKI. So personally, I tend to gravitate a little bit more to Karaya, um, mainly because the test you write is also your test harness. So there's no such limitation. So we can just create our tests um, and we can easily, more easily control the references. We can do a lot more than just wire them through to a setup or a teardown VI. We can make more complex uh, functions if we want or complex tests if we want. Um, so in this case, I'm just using file IO once again to just save some data to a file, which I'm gonna use in my unit test to then compare it to uh, these values here to see if they're almost equal. Uh, Remember, if you're using floating points and you're comparing them, make sure you use almost equal because otherwise, even though the values are the same, uh, but just the way the floating point is defined uh, might cause it to just say, no, it's, it's not the same, even though it practically is. Um, 
Okay, I'm nice on time. So, oh, Thomas is saying I'm biased, but I also use Karaya tests to act as functional documentation to explain how the API is intended to be used. Yeah, that's actually also a great way, a great way to use it, especially if you create a little bit more of a complex algorithm. It's a great way to showcase, okay, this is how it's supposed to be used. Um, especially between developers within your own team. Of course, if you're giving this to other people, other companies, um, you're of course going to give, uh, you're going to give a, a nice uh, package with, uh, with a tie, bow tie on top. But if it's within a team, this is absolutely uh, a, a good way to, to work uh, quite quickly. Next up, some closing thoughts on con uh, continuous integration. So in the beginning, we saw we can put uh, we can set the, the backends to default or CPU or CUDA or OpenCL or Intel One API. But when using continuous integration, I strongly recommend using the default backend and setting the device ID to zero. What this is going to do is, is it's going to tell the engine, uh, check if there's a CUDA graphics card, if there's none available, check if there's an OpenCL graphics card, if there's none available, check if there's an Intel One API graphics card uh, or source available, and if that's not available, it will default all the way back to CPU. So if you have VM, it will automatically fall back to the CPU, which makes your calculations a lot slower, but during unit tests, you're verifying the behavior, you're not doing a performance benchmark. So this uh, makes sure that your functions are completely scalable. Um, in my opinion, prefer file IO with uh, unit tests because you can get bigger data files and you don't have to do that processing, that data generation uh, on, on the left-view side. You can just pull in that data as you go forward. Uh, and you also have a nice package to say, this is with which I tested it. And then also ensure the code modules you write uh, work on both single GPUs and multi GPUs. Uh, so if you're truly making packages that are reusable, I do recommend making sure that your uh, modules or your actors have their while loop set to time loop. There is no downside of setting that time loop um, when using single, uh, single GPU. So if you're truly making something that's redistributable, um, even with single GPU, set it to time loop. So if someone else wants to put it in the multi-GPU solution, they can do that straight away without altering the, the code. So that's the end of my presentation, nicely on time. Um, I hope you liked it. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them now. Um, or uh, you can also afterwards contact me at info at g2cpu.com. Uh, also, if you want, want to have more information, uh, g2cpu.com. Uh, here, there are also some QR codes for those that want to have access to VIPM packages. You can also search for G2CPU on VIPM itself and you will find them. Um, so yeah, questions. So VJ is asking, any metric on what heats up more on usage, CPU versus GPU? Um, so GPUs tend to be a lot more powerful in general. Um, if heat is truly a consideration, you have to look at the specific uh, setup you're using. Um, if you're if we're talking about the internal GPU of your CPU, I often find that uh, high CPU performance heats up uh, heats up the CPU core itself more than the internal GPU. But I haven't really run that type of benchmark really intensively. Any other questions? For those of you, by the way, that are interested, I prepared an example on the upcoming uh, LeftView RT support. So the upcoming uh, version is going to have support for LeftView real time with full support for OpenCL and NVIDIA CUDA. So I have a nice example here available. Not really part of this presentation, but if you want to see it, feel free to stick around. First, any other questions? So VJ is asking, is any part of the toolkit open source? So the ArrayFire engine itself is open source. Uh, G Square CPU isn't, um, and the entire reason for that is more of a this took me so much time, so many years of development that if I make it open source um, and, and I'm still developing on it, it's, it's, it just doesn't make it viable. Um, 
how I interface the GPU. So that's completely taken away by, uh, by the array fire engine, luckily. Then ARM-based uh, GPUs. Um, so the array fire engine itself is, uh, does it have ARM compatibility? Uh, but I haven't tested it yet. Uh, I don't currently have access to a device with an ARM GPU in it, so I can't fully test it. That being said, I'm currently testing on an x86 system uh, with an NVIDIA graphics card in it with LiveView real time, and that completely works. So probably I can take lessons uh, learned along, but uh, once once it's been verified, um, I, I will uh, announce it. John is asking, how am I referen how am I communicating with the array fire engine? So yes, it is true call library nodes. Uh, so they're just a uh, libraries uh, a set of libraries that I'm using. Um, the main benefit of G-square CPU on top of ArrayFire is ArrayFire is, to put it in, in gentle terms, it's quite fragile. If you accidentally put in the wrong pointer, if you accidentally put in the wrong map, uh, or just use the functions in ways that they weren't intended, uh, it will crash the entire environment. So with G-square CPU, I made sure there's uh, if, if you use something that, that isn't allowed, uh, you will get a broken runtime error or an error if it's something that needs to be evaluated during runtime. So that's one of the benefits. Uh, another benefit uh, above, uh, on top of the, the array fire library calls themselves is, well, you have the probes, you have everything nicely visual rather than needing to do hundreds of function calls for a single uh, function. Um, so VJ is asking, this is a stretch, but can this toolkit somehow interface with the system exec VI and force the command window to run in the GPU alone? Uh, no. Um, so the system exec is, uh, calling a bash script, um, which is completely separate from this part of the environment, unfortunately. Any other questions? Thomas is saying, yeah, G-square CPU is not a simple LabVIEW wrapper indeed. So I added a ton of extra uh, functionality on top of it, um, but also you have the probes, you have all the extra things. You could get away with using just uh, the library calls, but it would take so much more time. It took me about three to four months to fully, uh, or to get my first application off the ground with just library calls. So that's why these wrappers truly save time. You can get up and running in minutes rather than weeks or months. Okay, so if there are no more questions, uh, I quickly wanna jump over to an example that I created this morning. Um, so this is still highly experimental, but I'm super excited to show it. So here uh, I'm communicating with a real-time setup, uh, which has an RTX 2060 installed that you can see. I don't know if it's super visible. Maybe if I, can I force it to show more options? I'm quickly, by the way, this is still highly experimental uh, and there's a really big chance this is not gonna, or there's something gonna go wrong. Okay, this makes it a lot more readable. So here I have a, so here I have a setup. Um, this is uh, actually a laptop running LabVIEW real time, but it acts quite similar to, to a PXI with uh, a graphics card installed. Um, and I just quickly sent over uh, the benchmarking tool. So this is just to showcase, hey, um, I'm, we now already have access to these different uh, technologies. So what this is gonna do is it's just gonna run a benchmark for the CPU, CUDA and OpenCL. And all it's doing internally is it's just gonna call a matrix multiplication to see what's going on. and. 
uh, or to run a matrix calculation and it's just going to see, okay, how long does this take? And doing a little bit of mathematics on top of it to get to floating points operations. So we're going to cycle through CPU, CUDA, and OpenCL. So I'm connected also with PuTTY. Um, let me just quickly resize this. So here you can see the monitoring of the GPU on, on the real-time targets. This is just via NVIDIA SMI, uh, which is a toolkit which comes with uh, NVIDIA CUDA. Um, I haven't publicly shown yet how you can install uh, NVIDIA graphics cards and CUDA on, uh, on real-time targets. This will come along as well uh, as this part of the project progresses and then we get to the release. Uh, and here we have HTOP just looking at the CPU usage. So if I run the example, let's just quickly need to deploy. Let's quickly show it here. So the first thing we're doing is CPU. So we can see, hey, the CPU is boosting in performance. Currently all the matrix multiplications are being done on the CPU. Once that is done, we can see here the GPU is picking up performance using 98%. And it's doing all those matrix multiplications. So it's constantly trying to get do bigger and bigger matrix multiplications to see, okay, what's the sweet spot? When are we getting uh, the best performance? And I do see an error has occurred. So uh, that was in the OpenCL backend. So I'm just quickly going to remove it. Like I said, this is still highly experimental. So a lot of stuff can go wrong. Let me just delete this real quick. We can just run it again without OpenCL. So we can see again, the CPU is doing quite a lot of work. And now the GPU is going to 80 watts. I even saw shortly 90 watts. And now we can see here, GPU is giving me uh, 4,500 uh, gigaflops, while the CPU itself is giving me 200 gigaflops. So by the way, this is a great improvement. So if you need a lot more performance on your real-time targets, you can just slot in a GPU and through this toolkit, you can immediately communicate with it. Another benefit is if you're still on the fence of using a GPU with this toolkit, you can still communicate with the internal GPU of your PXI or just the CPU. And then if you say, hey, I need, uh, I need to use the GPU, you can just buy a GPU, plug it in, just reconfigure your application, and that's all you need to do. Um, here they are. <laughs> Sorry, I uh, scrolled incorrectly. So these are the matrix sizes being used. But for the rest, there's nothing much more to it. These are just the same function call or the same uh, functions that you use in regular G squared CPU. Um, I'm still working on a couple of bugs, like probes are not yet working in real time. Um, I'm still working on that. Whenever, currently when I'm using probes, it crashes the system. Uh, also the uh, info string is not working yet uh, because I, I'm using X nodes uh, for pointer management. Uh, so I'm still, uh, I'm still working on those items. But as you can see already, uh, there are already internal builds available with uh, real time support. Any, any other questions? If I select the CPU as a target, how does the performance compare between G2 CPU and raw LabVIEW? That's an absolutely good question, Thomas. Um, so a lot of these functions in themselves have been made uh, multi-threaded uh, on the CPU. So if you do a matrix multiplication uh, here, it is by, uh, by itself, it will be distributed across all CPU cores, which is something you don't have in LabVIEW. So you're gonna see in LabVIEW that performance is gonna be a lot lower, but when using the CPU, when, when those functions are using all CPU cores, it, it will drastically improve. And especially if you have a lot of CPU cores, um, you will see a, a great improvement, especially with systems where you have a lot of CPU cores, they tend to have a lower clock speed um, so your single core performance tends to be a, a little bit worse, but an overall gain in multi-threading. So you don't have to do that management yourself, which is doing the, the, uh, the matrix multiplication. It is distributed across all cores. So as you can see here, I'm not doing anything fancy. I'm just generating some random data and doing matrix multiplication.
Does that answer your question? Awesome. Any other questions? All right, and I think we can wrap up. If you have, I'll stick around for a little bit longer. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. If afterwards you have any other questions, feel free to contact me either on LinkedIn or at info at g2cpu.com, um, where I'm happy to, to assist you in what way I can. Thank you very much.